Are you a student? Because I've had an Alex Johnson before as an advisee, but she was a female from Michigan at Defiance College, so totally different Alex Johnson. <laughs> so now whenever I hear Alex Johnson, I'm going to, I don't know what it's going to be. Um, but we talked a lot about Cleveland, Cleveland sports, lives right in the heart of Cleveland, and he came up here um, to work on some of the harmful algal bloom issues, and come on, come on, Alex. So our project was depth distribution of phytoplankton in western Lake Erie, and we were looking between looking for correlations between uh, data collected at the buoy and data that we got from the floor broke. So this became relevant after the Toledo water crisis in 2014, which basically there was a lot of microcystin in the water and caused a crisis in Toledo that caused the water to shut down for 400,000 people. So what is the cyanobacteria part of the cyanobacteria harmful algal bloom? Cyanobacteria are the phyla of bacteria that have toxins called, and one of them is microcystin, that poisons the water. Microcystin can be found in a few genera of cyanobacteria. The two that I mainly focused on researching were microcystis and planktothrix. Microcystin, the toxin, is a bad toxin, and it, 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 when it gets into your body or your pet's body or whoever drinks the water or interacts with the water, it'll go into your liver and do damage there. They thrive in conditions where water is warm, still, and stratified, like you see in western Lake Erie. Um, I also wanted to point out that the um, structure of microcystin is very stable, so it's not a boil advisory, it's a do not drink advisory. You can't boil the water, it's gonna, that will actually increase the concentration of the toxin. So after the crisis, a need for monitoring was um, established. We need to monitor in real time at many locations at different intake plants where different where water is taken from. So this information from the data buoys is accessible for water intake operators, for researchers, for just the general public that wants to know what's going on with the water. So the data buoys record many different fun things, but what I'm interested in was the chlorophyll fluorescence to estimate total um, algal biomass and the phycosanin fluorescence to measure, to estimate blue-green algae biomass. So all this information from the data buoys is sent every 50, well at least for ours, every 15 minutes to the Great Lakes Observing System. Um, so there's 19 data buoys online right now. And this is the map of them. Most of them are in the western basin of Lake Erie because that's where most of the problems occur with algae blooms. Though there are some in the central basin and the eastern basin. Um, the harmful, one of the really harmful ones are here in the western basin. Um, so this, this shows the friendly interface of the HABS data portal. So you can choose on a map what data buoy you want to look at. So here I have the OSU Gibraltar Island buoy and you see all the parameters there, the turbidity and the chlorophyll, pH, everything. Or you can look at it as a, on a map. So here I have selected blue, green algae and it shows the, the RFU, the fluorescent units at all the data buoys. So you can easily make comparisons like, oh, in this Sandusky Bay there's a lot more than in Maui Bay. And it's also really good for looking at data over a time period. So here you can tell in late June there's a lot more chlorophyll fluorescence than in where we are now in July. And just to show this even more, here we have three data buoys I sampled at, one in Toledo, one in Sandusky, and here at Gibraltar. And you can just easily see that there's a lot more blue-green algae in Sandusky than there is at Gibraltar and Toledo. But with every piece of technology, there's issues. And here, the main issue that I was looking at was data buoys measure at about a meter below the water, but water intake plants take from lower, five meters, six meters, just depends. Um, also, we're not measuring algal biomass, we're just measuring chlorophyll fluorescence, which is, we're assuming that fluorescence is proportional to biomass, but 
other some papers have found no correlation between algae biomass and fluorescence, while others have. Um, other problems are calibration of the SONs, which are the instruments in the buoy that record these measurements, technology problems, weather, and they're really expensive to operate. And this picture shows that when I first got here, the buoy was out of the water because of some problems. So it's you know there's problems with them. Um, this this is just to show the underestimation. So you might see this in Sandusky Bay where there's planktothrix. So the buoy's up there at the surface of the water. Planktothrix like to go go down lower. Um, that's just how they are. And so the buoys might say that there's not a lot of planktothrix in the water, but in reality, down by where the water intake plants are taken from, there is. And obviously, this is an over exaggeration because not all the planktothrix is going to be on the bottom. It's going to be spread throughout the water column, but it's going to be more concentrated down lower. And this is you might see this in um, Toledo, where microcystis um, has gas vacuoles, so it can go up higher. It's going to be not right at the surface, but it's going to be in the middle, in between um, the top layer and the bottom. So you might see this in Toledo, where there's a lot of microcystis near the data buoy, but not a lot where the, the water intake is. So the data buoy will say there's a lot, and water intake uh, operators will up their treatments, and that's uh, expensive. So what we did was we sampled at these three different sites here at Gibraltar Island, right out here, um, by the Toledo water intake, and north of, east of the um, Sandusky Bay, north of Cedar Point. And what we did was we sampled at each meter, down to five meters, so at the surface, at one meter, at two meter, at three meter, et cetera, down to five meters with the Van Dorn water sampler. And we used the fluoro probe to, to show um, how many of the different algae groups is in the water. So it can tell you how much green algae, cyanobacteria, diatoms, and cryptophytes are in your sample. So getting into the data a little bit, um, this is June 19 at Gibraltar. On the y-axis is depth, 0 to 5, top to bottom. And on the x-axis, we have the biomass. Um, so when I first got here, there was not a lot of blue-green algae here. Um, there were a lot of diatoms and green algae, however, and overall this was pretty low for the biomass um, overall at all the sites. But for Gibraltar, this, there was, this was one of the highest biomasses of total algae for this sampling period, at least up to this point. Here we have July or June 28th, so you can see there's a lot more diatoms. Still low biomass overall, but again, it's slightly increasing for this site. And July 5th we noticed that all the, the biomass of all the algae except the blue-green started to decrease a lot. And this is the clear water phase. Um, so there's a lot of zooplankton in the water, and they're grazing on some of the algae, like the green algae and the diatoms. And that allows the blue algae to, to not decrease in biomass, but to increase. They're not sought after like the other algae are. So the water appears, you might have noticed the past few weeks, it's pretty clear out there. That's why. Um, July 14th, we start to notice a slight increase in um, diatom and blue-green algae di um, biomass. We're still in the clear water phase, but it's starting to get out of that clear water phase. And this was at Toledo. Um, you notice there's a lot of diatoms and green algae. And I want to point out here that you can see on the line here that the diatoms are concentrated at three meters because they have silica, they're made of silica, so they sink lower. And that's where they're normally concentrated at. And in all the samples, it was like that. They concentrate maybe not at the bottom, at the five meters, but in between. So in the Sandusky Bay, I want to point out that the scale changes from 0 to 15 to 0 to 80 on the biomass on the X there. And that's because later you'll see that later in July, there was a lot of blue-green algae measured here. Um, so as of now, um, you can't really tell here, but there is a high blue-green algae biomass compared to all the other sites except the Sandusky site, which I'll show in a second. Um, pretty low amounts of everything else, and you can see again the diatoms are at three meter mark. That's where they're highly concentrated. So here, there's no blue-green, or I'm sorry, there's no green algae or diatoms measured at all. It was zero. The cryptophytes are pretty uniform throughout the water column. And you can see that the blue-green algae, 
there's a lot of them, it's close to um, 60 micrograms per liter. And they concentrated at two meters, and that's because they're gas vessel. They don't want to be right at the surface, but they don't want to be too far down either. Um, so you can see that there might be a slight underestimation because the, the buoy is at one meter. So it, there's less uh, uh, blue-green algae being measured at there than throughout the water. There's more throughout the water column at that two meters. Overall, this was the highest um, sample uh, sampling. So overall, how well does the buoy predict mean water column conditions? So this, these graphs show all of the biomass averaged out from the zero to five meters. And we found a pretty high R squared value for total chlorophyll, which is all algae together. So we had a 0.99 R squared and a really good P value. And the blue-green algae, it wasn't as good. It's still fairly well. Um, R squared 0.67. But what about at the one meter where the buoy measures its parameters at. We had a better R squared value here, 0.9927, a bit even better p value for the total chlorophyll, and the blue green algae was slightly worse, only 0.673, and on the other one, it was 0.674. So pretty consistent. So overall, it's been measuring chlorophyll A very well during this sampling period, and blue green algae fairly well. So compared to last year's studies and previous year's studies, it's kind of flipped. In previous years, they found that it measures, there's more, um, there's better correlation between blue-green algae than total chlorophyll. Um, but if you realize, look at these graphs, they have, I believe, 146 data points. I have nine. So just continuing sampling throughout the season, I think that we might start to see this trend. Um, and also, past studies, I want to point out, have found that buoy data or similar objects to buoys, to data buoys, have correlated well with fluoropoob analysis. Um, I, this is showing the data from July, that we collected July, July 18th. Um, this is a satellite image from the MODIS on July, NASA's MODIS July 17th. And you can see in the Sandusky Bay, there's a lot, there's a high density of cyanobacteria. And as you get further away, near, the, near offshore, there's a lower density. So this fits the algal loading hypothesis. So in the Sandusky Bay, in between this area here and this area is where we sampled was right there. That's where the 103 micrograms per liter was measured. And out of the bay was where the 54 micrograms per liter. So it's like a cascade effect. There's a lot near shore and it's gonna become less as you get offshore. So for future research, just continue sampling. Like I said, my data doesn't match previous year's data right now, but it, there's just not enough data. Um, I'll be continuing sampling myself for three more weeks, um, but this will continue throughout the season, um, using wind data to determine whether or not these data buoys are working in, in windy conditions is also um, an idea for future projects, and also knowing what kind of blue-green algae are at the buoys to know if there's if they're toxic or not is important to know. So acknowledgements, so I want to acknowledge Dr. Kane, um, Justin, his lab, Kevin and Eric, the two classes here, and the Friends of Stone Lab. And thanks, Dr. Kane, for keeping us all afloat with your humor. It's not just me, it's everyone, sure. <laughs> Thank you. not what I've been working on, uh -huh. but it's just things that I've known have been done in the past and I've been reading in the literature that there are other, there's other factors that affect whether or not the buoys are going to work. Yeah. And is it, right. in those or other not. studies, then, is it, is it the conditions in the here and now, like, related to that data sampling, or do you think there, is there an influence of, like, storms in preceding days? Like, how, how do previous events affect current day measurements? Do you have any indication? There, there could be. Um, so, like, in the Sandusky Bay, when it rained, that, that caused 
a lot of the algae, like algae further out to grow, so that the algal loading hypothesis. So we have a lot of algae near the Sandusky buoy we measured at on July 18th because of, of rain and weather. One more? Sir? This is not maybe a question, but maybe a methodological suggestion. Um, and I don't know if it will help, but in, one of, in some of the figures where you were plotting, say, the relative fluorescency from blue versus the pigment, or whatever the x-axis, versus the amount of Andy Obliger, um, he's been working with me on some fish stuff, which he's going to tell you about. But um, I just want to point out that on top of all his RU stuff, he's been up here since the beginning of June and working with me since the middle of May, helping me with a bunch of other stuff that's been going on up here on my dissertation research. So he's doing this, he's doing a lot more, and he's also staying up here with me till the beginning of August, and then he's going to be working with me this fall. So not only did he get this RU experience, but now he's into the <laughs> fish lab. Thank you. So uh, my project re revolves around the uh, visual detection thresholds of walleye under varying turbidity. Um, really, the relevance of uh, studying the walleye is important due to its, its impact on the Lake Erie sport fishing industry. And um, as, as we all know, the Lake, e Lake Erie sport fishing industry has, is responsible for a significant amount of um, Ohio's econ economic gains, and uh, so really, the walleye is, is just an important species to understand, especially as under, um, or I guess as Lake Erie turbidity grows. So as I said, uh, turbidity in Lake Erie has increased drastically. Um, I guess really as as uh, anthropogenic stressors increase, um, I guess in our inorganic turbidity and organic turbidity. So turbidity itself is uh, just simply the suspended salt particles found within the water column. In essence, it's what makes the water you look at hazy or cloudy. Um, inorganic turbidity and, or and organic turbidity are both found within the Lake Erie waters. And inorganic turbidity, um, I guess further out on it, sediment, sediment turbidity uh, is intensifying, intensifying as a result of increased severity of storms, uh, increased runoff, and other physical disturbances that add sediment to the water column. Uh, organic turbidity or algal turbidity I mean, is the thing that we all know about and it's intensifying as a result of increased nutrient loading from agricultural and urban management practices. Um, understanding that increased turbidity is, is occurring in Lake Erie, um, we are studying to see if the visual ecology of the Lake Erie fishes are going to be affected by this turbidity. Visual ecology is broadly defined as the study of, of specialized visual systems that function to meet the ecological need of an animal. Uh, so this is when you're relying on your visual sens sensory system to, to, to successfully forage, to successfully avoid uh, predators, and to successfully mate. Um, changes to the environment uh, in which these specifically fish live in are going to change the way that the fish can see. Um, and Especially in, in the case of Lake Erie, when you have increases in algal and sediment turbidity, the visual ecology of the fish living in the lake will be affected. Uh, specifically, we're, we looked at the walleye. Uh, the visual system of the walleye allows for color vision, and it also allows for special adaptation uh, to where walleye can see in low light levels, low light, low light environments. Uh, what we do know is that increased turbidity decreases light penetration in the water column. And we also know that algal turbidity not only decreases light penetration in the water column, but it also shifts the visual spectrum to uh, more green wavelengths. Uh, what we do not know is what the effects of this decreased light penetration and shift in, in wavelength is going to have on the lake area walleye. So in order to test this, um, one of the parameters of visual ecology 
is visual sensitivity. In other words, the ability of an individual to distinguish between an object and its background. For example, right here you see two black and white boxes at the top. Under normal light intensities, it's very easy to distinguish between the black and white color. As we decrease light intensity, uh, the, the contrast between black and white is decreased. It becomes more difficult to distinguish between the two colors. Eventually, if we decrease light intensity enough, it almost makes it impossible to distinguish between black and white as the contrast just essentially goes away. Uh, what we see in water is increased turbidity. It's going to have a similar effect to lake Erie fish, specifically the walleye. In order to test this, um, this visual sensitivity, we use an optimotor response test. Uh, this is a the optimotor response is a natural response of an animal to follow a moving stimuli. Uh, so for us, in our experiment, our moving stimulus was a striped screen um, that sit around a cylindrical tank. And when turned on, the screen moves at approximately 12 rotations per minute. And they're, in the walleye, they have an innate response to follow the striped lines. Um, the visual detection threshold is the point at which an animal is unable to differentiate between an object and its background. So as you increase uh, turbidity in the water, so we come at certain state, uh, we can serve an endpoint at which the walleye will be unable to follow the stripes and it'll stop spinning in a circular motion. So I guess the overall objective of our project was to determine the visual detection threshold for walleye under varying turbidity types and turbidity levels. Uh, so as you can see here, this is the far left or the far right picture is um, the walleye in sediment in the sediment treatment. The middle is the sediment plus an, an algae, so a combination of the two treatments, and the left being an algal treatment. Uh, what we're starting to see is if there are changes in the visual detection thresholds under these different turbidity types. Uh, a little bit of methodology. So after placing the fish into the cylindrical tank, uh, we, have, we give them a 15-minute acclimation period, and five minutes of that acclimation period with oxygen, and 10 minutes is with the screen moving in clear water. This just reduces stress and gives the walleye a chance to acclimate to this environment. Um, again, beginning in clear water, we will add approximately four NTU of treatment every two minutes. Now, NTU is simply a measurement of the light scattering at a 90 degree angle when compared to a blank, uh, which will have no light scattering. Uh, three treatments, sediments, uh, sediment, with just a mixture of water and Lake Erie mud that we pulled directly from the lake. Algal is a blended spinach mix uh, with water that is found to have um, similar color and particle size as the algae that's found in the lake. And then the combination is a 75% mix of <coughs> algal and a 25% mix of sediment. Uh, the difference in the ratio has to do with the density of the uh, turbidity treatments. So each fish was tested two times under each treatment. So they ran two sediment treatments, two algal and two combination treatments for a total of six trials per fish. Um, we had five total fish, multiply that by six trials per fish, and you had 30 trials. Now these trials are lengthy. They last approximately an hour and a half to two and a half hours. So this is it's a process, but it's very interesting because when you reach the point where the fish stops following the uh, stripes on the screen, you're given almost immediate data points because that essentially is the visual detection threshold. Uh, going into the results, looking at an individual walleye and his results in the optimotor test, uh, this graph shows the relationship between the endpoint NTU, so the point at which the walleye stops following the screen, and the treatment type. Uh, each individual data point represents an average of the, um, of the trials for each thing, so the sediment um, found to be around 120 NTU as an average of both trials that ran. Essentially what you're looking at here is the fact that under sediment turbidity, walleye can, can see the moving stripes with, um, at higher turbidities than the combo and the algae trial. Uh, another relationship that we tested for was between uh, the relationship between endpoint and standard length. Unfortunately, uh, at this particular sample size that we found, the relationship really wasn't strong enough. Um, to show anything between endpoint and standard length. So what this graph does show is evidence of the treatment effect across all five walleye tested. So in essence, the top trend line represents all the uh, sediment, the average sediment trials for five fish. 
So again, this keeps keeps in line with the previous slide, where it seems that walleye can can visually see better in the sediment trials at higher turbidities with an intermediate combination and lowest in algae. Uh, taking each individual endpoint and combining them according to the treatment type, we found that visual detection thresholds in sediment turbidity were more than double that of algal turbidity. Uh, a combination of the two was intermediate again. Uh, and as you can see on this, on the slide, so the average um, endpoint in the sediment trials was 101.3 NTU for combo 66.6 .6 and for algal 40.5. So just taking a step back and looking at the big picture of this, our main objective was to use the optimal response test to determine visual detection thresholds. Uh, our results indicated that there was variation in the visual sensitivity, so variation in where the fish uh, stops following the stripes across all treatment types. However, we found that algae, algal turbidity causes disruptions at much lower turbidities than sediment combination treatments. Um, looking into the implications of this, uh, the walleye used their visual sensory, uh, visual sensory system to to uh, just really, to, as I said earlier in the visual ecology, to be successful in foraging, uh, predator avoidance, and mating. And as we were all, all saw last week, uh, harmful, algae, harmful algae blooms are, are not going away, unfortunately. Uh, this year we're predicting a pretty significant algae bloom. And the fact that these walleye are, going, are being affected by algal turbidity at, at greater lengths than sediment and uh, combination trials really shows that the walleye is going to have to adjust its behavior in order to continue being successful. Now, how, this is, how the adjustments will be made, we don't know. The impacts of, of algae really be, uh, or the impacts of the population and commu community level interactions with uh, the lake and, and through in differing uh, turbidity types can be seen in a way through this, this framework that's created by looking at individual sensitivity on each walleye. Uh, and again, this is such an important fish to study due to uh, its, its relevant impact on the mercury sport fishing industry. Um, so just a couple of acknowledgments. Um, I'd like to thank Stone Lab and Ohio Sea Grant, obviously, for allowing me to have this opportunity to come up here and study. Uh, I'd like to thank my supervisors, Chelsea Neiman and Dr. Suzanne Gray. And then, again, just all the uh, people who are involved in going out and catching walleye and bringing them into the lab. Obviously, nothing could be done without that. So age and size are kind of correlated with the walleye. Um, and I know when we when we go back to Columbus, we're probably gonna we're looking at age and we're looking at eye dynamics and, and brain size. So right now I'm not entirely not entirely sure, but based on length um, and just really the small sample size, it's, it's tough to tell. Yeah, so we use so we used uh, just a random number generator um, that gave us an order of of the treatments, um, and then we were I basically essentially I did one fish per day. So you do a fish, and you can you know, let it kind of reacclimate to its environment, reduce its stress, and then the next day usually the fish would come back ready to go. So each thing looks at least similar in general to the ones for the shiners from last year. And you sort of have to assume that it has something to do with the peak sensitivity of the different cone, uh, cone visual receptors that they probably evolved for regular turbidity rather than algae influence right. turbidity. Right. So I guess it's not so surprising on some level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's one of the big implications is this, you know, is this human induced algal wounds. Obviously there's natural aspect of it, but as, as we've increased nutrient loading in the lake and it's affected the visual environment of the water, how these fish are responding to it, are, are they adapting as, you know, as we speak or, or, you know, because as you said, it's not really something that they've had to 
obviously back in the 70s. But that would but be not, an interesting but. thing to look at going forward if you could do a long-term study to see if they start selecting for fish that have a little bit different spectral sensitivity. Yeah, so actually when in Columbus we have um, species, I think from around 30, 30 40 years ago, and um, we're testing that, so we're going to compare, I guess, pupil size and, and the eye dynamics of the fish to see if it's adjusted or you know, changing as, as obviously the visual environment changes like Erie. That's really interesting. Do you have any preliminary information about um, does eye morphology change with turbidity or any other factor? I personally, I haven't got into that. I know when I go back in the fall, I'm going to maybe I'll take a better look into this mess with that section. But um, so I, I'm not prepared to answer. My anecdotal evidence is I caught a wad in a really, really dark year stained lake one time, mm -hmm. and I swore it had the biggest eye <laughs> <size laughs> in the wad. Yeah. So that was the most thing I've That would be my comment. Those are some of the creepiest pictures I've ever seen of walleye before in my life. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you've just given me horrific nightmares for the rest of my life, so thank you, man. <laughs> is there time for one oh, just quick methodology question? Uh, so the 15 minute acclimation, the 15 acclimate, 15 minute acclimation period. Did you guys actually test that to track like when you put them in? Did it seem like they were like the opercular movement slowed down at 15, or is it better to wait a, an hour? Well, what, I guess one of the weird aspects is that uh, in many of the fish, we didn't really see movement initially in clear water because, as I said, they're ad adapted for low light environments. Uh, but when you originally put the fish in, it kind of freaks out for a little while, and we kind of determined after 15 minutes that and it stopped. So then you start adding turbidity, and hopefully, when a certain NTU runs around, he'll start spinning due to the lower light. So Kirsten will be uh, presenting on some of the uh, research that we actually collected last May when we were out on the research crews, and uh, she'll be presenting some of that today. Kirsten is from Rock, you go to school at Rockford? Rockford University in Rockford. Illinois. And so she doesn't really have any exposure to fisheries, but in her cover letters that she wanted, she was in, interested in fisheries, so we tried to give her somewhat of a dose of uh, fish squeezer's life. So, <laughs> we'll see. So I did a project with the USGS and Chris. Um, we were looking at how Acquiesce, which is an anesthetic for fish, um, affects lake trout, which is a native top predator in Lake Erie. So we want to keep it here and we want to know more about it. So the Lake Erie Committee is an organization made up of four surrounding states, Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York, and of course, um, Ontario and Canada. So what they're trying to do is keep Lake Erie as a quality habitat by protecting things like native species and preserving habitat, as well as trying to keep invasives out and preserve endangered species. So the lake trout, um, its populations have been declining and the invasion of the sea lamprey is a major reason as to why. So that's one of um, Lake Erie's long history of instabilities is that we keep having invasives come in, we have habitat segregation and um, water quality issues. So according to the LEC, they want uh, restoration and management practices to kind of take the system as a whole and protect um, top predators and keep invasives out while protecting the habitat, trying to keep all of that together, not just looking at one aspect. So just a little background on the lake trout. Their population started declining in the 1900s, um, and they so they reside in the eastern basin in the cold, deep water. Um, and in the 70s, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife decided that it was time to start stocking these fish. Their populations were not maintaining themselves. And currently, there's no natural sufficient reproducing population of lake trout in the area. Um, the telemetry project I'm about to get into, so this right here is just kind of how they release the fish. You put the fish inside of there and lower them over instead of just tossing them back in. So it's a little nicer. So the USGS is doing this telemetry project where they're catching lake trout and inserting transmitters into them 
and when they release them, then there's receivers placed in the lake. So as the fish swims by, it kind of emits this acoustic signal that's picked up by this receiver. So this is another actual receiver, and these are some of the various size of transmitters. They um, are using the larger size ones because they have a better battery life. Um, so you can use the telemetry data to kind of infer where the lake trout are in the area, where is their spawning habitat going to be, so we can go back and look at that and see why aren't they successfully reproducing? Is there something wrong with the habitat? So um, USGS did this telemetry project, and in May of this year in Erie, Pennsylvania, they ended up tagging 27 lake trout. Um, and in order to insert the transmitter, they have to put the fish under anesthesia before the surgery takes place. Um, so they actually re recorded the anesthesia process, which is what I use to infer my, da my data from. And this right here is an actual transmitter getting placed into one of these 27 lake trout that they did this year. So the anesthetic that they were using is called Acquies. Um It's an alternative to MS-222, which is kind of on its way out. Um, it's the only approved fish anesthetic by the FDA currently in the U.S., but we're trying to um, use different things because MS-222 is carcinogenic and there is a 21-day hold period on the fish after they're exposed to it. And with Acquies, you can let the fish go after a short recovery period, maybe a half an hour. So um, it, Acquies requires lower concentrations. It's actually just a synthetic clove oil. Um, and it's improved, approved in various countries like Australia and Chile. So the actual questions that I want to take a look at um, is, was there an average time that the fish took to get to each threshold? Did the tank order affect the amount of time that each fish took to get to each threshold? So by tank order, I mean um, you make a batch, batch of anesthesia and place the fish inside of the anesthesia. And you can put up to five fish in there. So you put one in, take it out, put another one in, and you can do that up to five times. So did fish one get there faster than fish five? Um, and then we looked at length of the fish versus each threshold. And finally, we were looking at the opercular rate versus the stages of anesthesia. So the gills, you have the operculum. It's like the bony covering over that. And each time the fish breathes, they open that flap. So what is the time in between each breath? So there's this paper by Summer, Salt, and Smith that is often referred to as the stages of anesthesia. So um, they range from the fish is completely normal to the fish asphyxiated and died. In this study, we're just looking at kind of the normalcy stage, so stage zero. Um, stage three, where the fish experiences a partial loss of equilibrium. And then stage four, which is where you want the fish at for surgery. They're totally out. They've lost their equilibrium. They're not responsive to stimulus. Um, so what I did was I looked at the videos of the anesthesia process being reported. And I went through and noted the time at which each one of these thresholds that we um, set up occurred at. So when did the fish enter the tank? When did they stop flopping around and calm down? Um, when did they experience their first sign of loss of equilibrium, so that initial roll? Um, stage three is when they have the partial loss of equilibrium, and stage four, the total loss of equi equilibrium, and finally, when was the fish removed? So. Um, I'm going to try to show you a video. Maybe it'll work on here. Awesome. So this is kind of that initial stage. The fish goes in, and he's flopping around and freaking out. And um, the end of initial activity is when he calms down. So that's my threshold that I'm looking at here. So next, when did they start to lose their equilibrium? And 
the end of this clip, he's actually able to rate himself. So that's kind of the initial rule. So now he partially lost his equilibrium. He's still able to move his fins, but he cannot rate himself anymore. And finally, this is where we want them for surgery. So it's similar to stage three, but you can still see his caudal fin is moving. Um, and as he progresses to stage four, he won't be moving at all, which is where you want him. So like, okay, I'm out, the boat's just kind of moving. And then finally, the fish gets removed from the anesthesia and has the surgery performed, which takes about a minute and a half to two minutes to do. Okay. So this is Abby. She works with um, she worked with the USGS doing this project, and now she works with DNR. And I actually got to go over and meet her on one of my free days. So looking at the data. Um, how long, on average, did it take each fish to get to each threshold? So this stage zero is what we're calling the end of the initial activity, when they stop flopping around. And that took about 19 seconds overall for the fish to reach that stage. And then when did they hit that initial roll stage? It took about 2 minutes and 50 seconds for them to get there. Um, stage three, that partial loss of equilibrium, that took about 4 minutes and 10 seconds. Stage four, which is where we want them for surgery, took about eight minutes and 20 seconds. And finally, they were removed from the tank around 10 minutes and eight seconds. So then we started correlating the tank order. So did fish one get there faster than fish five to each threshold? And with the confidence interval, intervals in here, you can see there's not really any difference. So the tank order to the initial roll did not really have a significant correlation. And again, that's what we see here with the partial loss of equilibrium at stage three. The tank order did not really correlate to um, stage three. And again, with the total loss of equilibrium, we just didn't find the correlation there for being removed from the tank. So then we started looking at the length of the, length of the fish in comparison to each threshold. So um, the initial activity actually showed an inverse relationship. So by that, I mean the bigger the fish was, the less time it took for them to calm down. Um, the initial roll versus the length of the fish, we didn't see any kind of correlation there. And again, with the partial loss of equilibrium, there's not really a correlation there either. Total loss, same thing, no correlation. And finally, the removal of the fish, no correlation again. So then what we started doing was looking at those opercular rates, so how fast is the fish breathing. This is just kind of the raw data, which looks very messy. So what we did was we went through, and down here we put each, um, all of this data into 30-second bins. So each one of these dots is a 30-second time period with the confidence interval on top and bottom. So. Um, most of the fish exhibited this pattern where you put them in the tank and they're freaking out. They're breathing really rapidly. And then as time progresses and they get further into the stages of anesthesia, anesthesia you kind of get more time in between each breath. A couple of the fish had this kind of interesting drop off. They, so they have this same trend where they're breathing really fast at the beginning and they slow down. But then they speed back up once they are fur further along. We were wondering if maybe they're progressing into one of those later stages of anesthesia, anesthesia stage five or stage six, which is where they can asphyxiate from lack, lack of oxygen. So maybe they're starting to realize, like, oh, I'm not meeting my oxygen demand. I need to start breathing faster. Um, so just a little summary. It took about 19 seconds for each fish to hit the initial, the end of the initial activity. 
about two minutes and 50 seconds for them to initially roll, start to lose their equilibrium. About four minutes and 10 seconds for them to partially lose their equilibrium. Eight minutes and 20 seconds to totally lose it. They're out, they're ready for surgery. And about 10 minutes and eight seconds to be removed from the tank. Um, the threshold for the tank order, other than that inverse relationship between the initial activity and length, there was no real correlation. Um, and then the opercular pattern, so breathing really fast and then slowing down and then that drop off in a few of the fish. So the implications for this was fish length and tank order were not correlated to the average time it takes fish to get, to, to get through the stages of anesthesia. Um, in future work going forward, we, well, Chris was talking about possibly letting a few fish progress through the stages to five and six and see if that drop off is an indicator of stage five or six anesthesia. Um, and then we could repeat the study using various concentrations and see if more acquiesce or less acquiesce gets the fish there faster or slower. And this is kind of a special thanks for everybody for this opportunity. grow out of control 
And then some of the types of algae can actually produce toxic toxins um, that can be harmful to humans because they poison drinking water, um, they poison the fish, and overall they just end up harmful to the humans, the ecosystems, and even the economies of the lakes that they grow in. A good example of this is the Toledo water crisis, which you might have heard of. Um, happened in 2014, and for 4, 400,000 people in Toledo, um, a do not drink warning was issued, and they weren't able to use their water, which is awful. And the New York Times actually wrote an article all about it, and they said, Lake Erie is in trouble and getting worse by the year. So obviously that's the, that's the message that's getting out there. So this is something we need to keep looking into and trying to make better. So cyanobacteria, um, this is the, the specific type of algae that I looked at in my study. They're photosynthetic bacteria, actually, and they're what causes the harmful algal blooms. Um, not all the cyanobacteria make toxins, but increasing water temperatures is shown to favor cyanobacterial blooming. And then humans contribute to this by increasing nitrogen and phosphorus in the water through sources like agricultural runoff and using fertilizer on their lawns and stuff like that. Um, a big component of this is if a macronutrient like nitrogen and phosphorus is in low supply in the water, then growth of this algae will be reduced. But humans go and they put it back into the water, which increases growth. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, Cyclotoxins, then, are a type of toxin that are produced by these cyanobacteria, and they're a neurotoxin. Um, the symptoms, they range from low exposure, you get tingling around your mouth and your arms and legs, and then go to high exposure and you can get muscle paralysis, respiratory failure, and ultimately death. And this is relevant to Lake Erie because the genes for this toxin were found in sources of drinking water by the Ohio EPA. Um, they were found in inland Ohio lakes and Lake Erie, and the Ohio EPA said they suspect a benthic source. So that's kind of what I had to investigate here. But most of the research currently being done on cyanobacterial toxins is focused on microcystins, which are a more common type, and those are actually the types that were involved in the Toledo water crisis. So like I said before, excess nutrient loading drives these cyanobacterial blooms. You guys all saw the HABS forecast, and it showed that more phosphorus going into the lake led to larger algal blooms. So I'm asking today, does the same apply to benthic cyanobacteria? Um, and I'm testing some of the nutrient limitations on this in the benthic algae using something called a nutrient diffusing substrate, which I think I talked about in the next slide. But a point of interest here that I thought was cool, this is a picture of a phosphorus mine. So that's where they get the stuff that's used to make the fertilizer. I'm wondering about that. So here's my substrate that I use. Um, it's a clay pot, and I made it by putting the pot on a half a petri dish and covering it with electrical tape so that the stuff inside didn't fall out. Um, it took a lot of engineering finesse to make this work. We tried a lot of glue and other stuff that just ended up falling apart when it was submerged in water. So once we had our design, I put agar with nutrients in it into each pot. I let them solidify, and then I labeled them by light level that I used and nutrient treatment that I used. And then we tested whether or not these would actually work to let nutrients out into the water by putting a couple of them in a bucket of distilled water and just tracking how much was released over time. We found out, yes, yeah, yeah, they let out a lot of nutrients. Hence, nutrient diffusing substrate. Um, some more background on limiting nutrients. So basically, if a necessary nutrient for algae growth is lacking, the growth won't occur. So I made a little recitation on top, as you can see up here. Um, in theory, I add these nutrients, and then I let them incubate, or just let them grow. And you can see growth on, for example, this is just an example. In these pots, um, there's growth on the phosphorus and the phosphorus and nitrogen pot. And this just goes to show that phosphorus was the limiting nutrient in this experiment because there was only growth when the algae were able to utilize phosphorus that I gave them. I got my methods from a previous similar experiment um, done in 1984 in Douglas Lake, Michigan, in which they used a very similar nutrient diffusing substrate, the clay pot. Um, the methods for this didn't go into a lot of detail, so that's where, the, that's where we kind of had to engineer it all ourselves and come up with it. But they did use the agar combined with the nutrients. Um, they used a similar depth, and their experiment period was a little bit longer. But reading about this really gave me some context and allowed me to figure out maybe what I would see on my pot. So the actual questions I'm looking at. Does the addition of nutrients cause more benthic algae growth in Lake Erie in this time of year? And I'm looking at phosphorus and two types of nitrogen, nitrate and ammonium. Um, and then do benthic algae grow better at high light or low light? And are benthic cyanobacteria growing in this environment? And if so, are they known as toxin producers? 
my experimental setup, I had 36 total pots. I have three of each nutrient combination for each light level, which I'll talk about again in the next slide. So I had my controls, I had nitrate only, ammonium only, phosphate only, and then my two combinations with phosphate and nitrate, phosphate and ammonia. And you can actually see here how I did it. A funnel, put the agar right into the pot, let it solidify. So actually putting these in the water happened on June 26th. We put them in milk crates, um, and then we put wire mesh over the crate, zip tied and closed, and then we tied them together and we put them out in the water. And I had four crates total with nine pots in each, and I randomly distributed the nutrient treatments into each pot. And then we tied them to the docks right outside the lab out there. Um, our highlight crate was 0.5 meters below the surface, and our low light was 1.5. Um, chlorophyll was monitored throughout this with a fluoroprobe, which is this nifty thing right here. Each pot was measured for green algae, cyanobacteria, diatoms, tryptophytes, and total concentration. And how this worked was you can see this little wand right here, and I could actually take that and I could put it right on my pot so I could measure the algae growth in plots around the pot. So the first test was on day two of the experiment. There was very little growth. Um, the second test on day seven, there was an explosion of growth, but it was on the mesh cover <laughs> over. <laughs> so we had to take the covers off and put them back out there. And then finally we got some growth on there at day 10. Um, the concentrations actually doubled or tripled from the previous test. So we finally did get some growth on there. More growth on the pots and more light, you can see here. And then a lot of green algae and diatoms. After two weeks, we took this down and we did our final floor pro test. And then to finish it out, we scraped algae off the pot in a certain area. You can see it here. Um, to test the potential influence of light level on the chlorophyll produced. And then we're going to look for saxitoxins in the algae we scraped off later. So our sample processing and analysis, um, the algae we scraped off was filtered for total solids. We weighed it, we dried it, we weighed it again to find total organic solids. And then we did a two-factor ANOVA um, on our results. And here you can see my drying filters. So this graph shows that chlorophyll levels increased over time in our highlight treatment. So at the bottom, you can see the date and just how the time progresses. And each of these set of dots is a day when I use the fluoropro to test my pot. And then on this side, you can see the total um, chlorophyll concentration. You can see that there was some growth, there was a little more growth, and then we took the mesh off, and there was a lot more growth. <laughs> And then it kind of evened out for our last test there. And then in this one, you can see a comparison between the highlight and the low light for total growth. Um, we found there was no real difference between light level and nutrients here. We both saw, or they both, both treatments saw increasing growth over time. Um, this is total cyanobacteria, which increased over time. And then we also saw more cyanobacteria growth at highlight levels. So following the trend in total chlorophyll production, um, our cyanobacteria growth went up for each test that I did. Um, you can clearly see that for the highlight pot, it was around 12 or 14 per test. But then for the low light, it was only 8 through 10 um, micrograms per centimeter squared. So there's a lot less growth in low light. So at two weeks, you can see more total chlorophyll at highlight and with the ammonium test. Um, this graph shows on my nutrient treatments down here, you can see the control and the nitrates and ammonia, phosphate, and then the combinations, and then total chlorophyll again on this side. So it's easy to see that my highlight in red was the highest in each category, and my low light grew less in each category. And then this is another cyanobacteria one. There was more growth at highlight and no clear pattern of nutrient enrichment. So you can see again more growth at the highlight here. But then there's no real trend in which nutrient helps the cyanobacteria grow more than any other. And then at two weeks, you can also see the highest, or highest organic matter at the highlight. It's very clear to see here. Red bars are the highest. Um, after we did all that, we took our scraped algae and we put it under the microscope to look for cyanobacteria. And we ended up finding three um, different types of that, Firmidium, Lingvia, and Oscillatora. I wish I had pictures from the actual microscope, so they're really hard to take, so these are better examples. But the interesting thing is that all these are known producers of sax toxins, 
So it's going to be interesting to see whether or not the out or the sign of which we actually grew will be produced with cytotoxin as well, which I think we're going to find out maybe next week. So I'll go back to my question, tell you guys what the significance of this. Um, does the addition of nutrients cause more benthic algae growth? At this time, there was no significant difference among my nutrient treatments, which kind of makes sense because you can see algae growth all over the rocks out there, all over the docks. Um, benthic algae is kind of growing everywhere, which indicates there is, that there is no limiting nutrient for this time. Um, but do benthic algae grow better at highlight or low light? I found a lot more overall growth in my highlight pot. And then my last one, are benthic cyanobacteria present? Yes, they are. We detected at least three genera of them that are known to accept the producers. So that'll be interesting to test later. And if we find out that these are producing saxotoxin genes, then this experiment could be worth repeating. If I were to do this again, um, to reduce the contamination between nutrients leaching together and the algae just feeding off of all of them, I might think about separating my treatments into different areas so that the nutrients can stay together. I have a suggestion to test my algae coefficient for depth and then to let the experiment run longer than two weeks, which both make sense. And um, test the experiment maybe different times during the summer bloom season to see if limiting nutrients change or develop throughout the season. And then also use a different type of nutrient fusing substrate, like a plastic container with a filter on top, which would be easier just to allow me to place the fluoroprobe on <coughs> one, one spot on the top of it instead of having to go other on the top. So that's something I'm going to consider if I do end up repeating it. Um, here's some sources. And my acknowledgments, um, my advisor, Dr. Chaffin, Maddie Lambrick, um, Eric and Kevin, Ohio Sea Grant, Friends of Film Laboratory, and Dr. Tom Brigman, who gave me his floor for a bond to use. <laughs> <laughs> total chlorophyll production at highlight and with ammonium. So Okay, so so you were maybe maybe that in your other in your other uh, conclusion that was uh, regarding cyanobacteria and taking Actually yeah. <coughs> I think I think that conclusion was about cyanobacteria. Okay, yeah. Maybe I just so, said nutrient treatments okay. instead, right. but just move that down in your head and yeah, yeah. continue <laughs> with your life. <laughs> Highlight low light. Did you actually yes. get light readings, and did you compare that with what you might see out at, you know, so, you know, how far down are you going to see those kind of light levels naturally in the light? That's a good question. We did take light levels at the beginning, but um, we kind of fell off on doing that, among other stuff. But in class, on boat sampling, we also did some light levels. Although I can't remember right now, like how those are compared to each other. I never really thought about it before you asked that. Yeah. Are there any other things that are different about those light levels? So, like, do you know it's the light per se, or is it? Are there temperature variations or other things that might have influenced? Yeah, that could definitely be possible. Um, thinking about temperature or dissolved oxygen, but they were only a, they were only a meter apart, and I I do I can't say that like a meter of depth could make a big difference, but it might not. It might not in just the depth of water we were looking at. It could still be very similar.
always trying to make it, you know, specific to that person, make it personal. And Maddie listed my name in, in her cover letter, so that gets, you know, your supervisor, potential employer, that draws their attention really well. So just try to, you know, when you make a cover letter, just don't do a generic cover letter. I, I've seen cover letters before that have dear blank, and it's actually blank. <laughs> like, and they actually submitted a earlier version. So, uh, dear blank, I'm really interested in doing that blank. So, um, your cover letters are very important. So, um, that Maddie is going to talk about a project uh, we've been working on for the last four years, and uh, we're going to put a nice bow on on this project at the end of the summer. Okay, thank you. Um, my presentation is nutrient limitations in the central basin of Lake Erie. So some background information, um, we've already kind of gone over this, but that's okay. So an algal bloom is an overgrowth of algae um, that grows out of control and produces toxic or harmful effects on people, uh, fish, uh, marine life, mammals, and birds. So why are these <coughs> blooms a problem? So these blooms um, have the ability to produce toxins such as neurotoxins and liver toxins. Um, these can be um, serious to humans, pets, and aquatic life. So cyanobacteria, a uh, type of algae, have the ability to produce microcystin, which is a type of toxin. Um, it's a liver toxin that um, can be fatal when exposed to in high enough levels. So some causes of algal blooms, um, excess nutrients. Uh, we talk and we hear a lot about agriculture, um, fertilizers that are made with phosphorus and nitrogen, um, manure from farm animals. Um, we also have effects from stormwater, precipitation, um, wastewater, um, and fossil fuels in industry, agriculture, or transportation. So um, cyanobacteria, um, a type of algae, it is classified as blue-green algae, and it is a photoautotroph. Um, some of these cyanobacteria can produce toxins, um, and they're normally found in high-nutrient waters. Um, they need a high phosphorus. And some of them need nitrogen, but some of them don't. Um, and that's because some of them can fix um, atmospheric nitrogen at um, these heterocysts, which are these large, uh, larger cells here and here um, in the algae. So algal blooms on the Great Lakes. Um, so here in the red circles are the western basin of Lake Erie. Um, this is Green Bay, and this is Saginaw Bay. So uh, my research is on uh, the central basin of Lake Erie, so that is this yellow area right here. So this is another um, uh, map of the central basin, so um, it's about 30 meters at its deepest, and it can go um, back down to ranging from 15, or 15 to 30 meters. Um, so why are we setting the Lake Erie central basin? Um, so much research is known on the western basin but not necessarily on the central basin uh, cyanobacteria. Um, previously, um, Stone Lab research has told us that these blooms occur early to mid-July um, and that uh, Delicosporum is the dominant um, cyanobacterium found in the water. Um, in other lakes, it's normally found in uh, low nitrogen, high phosphorus waters, but in the central basin, the waters are high nitrogen, uh, low phosphorus, which is sort of the opposite um, in the central basin. So we're concerned as um, to why are we finding these blooms in the central basin. So uh, my research project specifically um, is studying the overall phytoplankton nutrient limitations in the central basin. Um, we're trying to determine why delicosperm is found in the central basin. Um, so a little bit about delicosperm, it is a nitrogen fixer. Um, so this indicates that uh, nitrogen limitations um, should be uh, present in um, in the lake. So um, this is uh, contrary because nitrate is actually in high concentration. Um, iron is needed for the nitrate assimilation. Um, so we're also concerned with looking at iron as a limiting factor for this um, phytoplankton growth. Um, so our hypothesis is um, adding phosphorus and iron together will result in greater growth than phosphorus alone. So um, to, to 
determine limiting nutrients, we use um, a method called the nutrient bioassay. Um, so this is sort of um, supposed to represent like nutrient bottles, um, sort of similar to what Marissa talked about. So the uh, growth here in the phosphorus and the phosphorus and nitrogen indicates that the phosphorus is a limiting nutrient since we don't see any growth um, here in the nitrogen bottle after incubation, but we do see it in the phosphorus and phosphorus plus nitrogen. So uh, my study site was in Avon, Ohio, which is 20 meters off the shore, uh, right about here. It's about 20 meters. Um, so to set up the experiment, we used 27 one liter nutrient bottles. Um, we had a control, which was just lake water. We had a bottle with uh, phosphorus only. We had a bottle with ammonium only. We had a phosphorus and ammonia together. Uh, we had phosphorus and iron. Uh, we used iron um, because iron is required for nitrate assimilation. So we wanted to look at that. Um, we also have one with phosphorus and silica. And silica is important because it uh, builds the cell wall of diatoms. Um, we use phosphorus and boron because um, boron is used in heterosis formation of the cyanobacteria. We have a bottle with uh, phosphorus and ammonia and all the trace metals, and then we have one with phosphorus and nitrate. So after we poured in uh, the lake water into the bottles, we added these various nutrients um, in the corresponding bottles. Um, we put them in a random order um, in the incubator, um, set at a constant light level and a constant uh, temperature that we recorded when we were out of the lake sampling. Um, and we left the caps off these bottles to allow for carbon dioxide and oxygen exchange. So um, to collect our data, we used the fluoroprobe. And the fluoroprobe is used to measure these different types of algae. Um, it's used to measure a lot more things, actually, but we were just focused on these uh, green algae, blue-green algae, diatoms, and cryptophytes. Uh, we also use the nutrient analyzer. Um, we were looking at assimilation of nitrate, um, and we use this to measure uh, the nitrate concentration before and after the incubation. So um, this graph here is representing uh, the chlorophyll concentration in uh, micrograms per liter, and then the different treatments here on the x-axis. So this is just the same graph, but just with the bars um, added into it. And so this is telling us that phosphorus and ammonium uh, limited the growth of the uh, chlorophyll A. And it's important to note that um, nitrate um, here um, was not being able to be used um, by, the, by the algae. Now, we did our test um, using one-way um, ANOVA statistics, and we performed a two-key test with a p-value of 0 0.05. Um, here, the graph shows um, this is just a little bit later. Um, we collected another sample of June 21st. Um, this is showing a phosphorus, nitrogen, and boron limitation. So phosphorus here, um, nitrogen, and boron. Um, the, the letters above these uh, bars represent different groups of significance. Um, here, um, our results are show a little bit of a weird trend. We saw um, ammonium actually inhibited the growth of the algae. Um, the reason for this, we think, is that um, there was actually such a high um, concentration of ammonium that the algae actu actually um, experienced uh, toxic effects um, from such a large amount of that. Um, here uh, on July 11th, um, it also showed that there was a phosphorus and nitrogen limitation out in the lake. Um, here um, we are looking at now nitrate concentration um, compared to all our different treatments. And here, um, it's important to look at these bars here, the phosphorus and then the phosphorus and iron. Um, so because the phosphorus and iron bar is not less than the phosphorus only bar, we can conclude that the ambient nitrate assimilation was not impacted by adding iron. So when we added iron, the algae weren't able to take up more than just with um, phosphorus alone. So if they were, then this bar would be um, lower than this bar. So um, this was the fourth year that uh, Justin's lab did this project. So in total, there were 18 experiments uh, like mine. I just did uh, four. Um, so yeah, this has been going on for four years. Um, the next couple slides are some uh, conclusions about uh, the data. We have percentage of experiments where treatments resulted in higher chlorophyll than the control, and then some are experiments where treatment resulted in higher
higher chlorophyll than phosphorus only. So the first one is here, and basically we're saying that 86% of experiment, experiments performed were primarily phosphorus limited. So phosphorus is likely the limiting nutrient out there in the central basin, um, and we have 18 um, data points to back that, back that up. Um, this graph here is representing um, the importance of all these other nutrients in um, uh, biomass production. So um, ammonium, iron, um, molybdenum, which um, that actually was used uh, in previous years. We used silica instead since we were getting some better results. So um, higher biomass with phosphorus and other nutrients. So um, there were more experiments with significantly greater chlorophyll A and phosphorus only in um, all of these, so about 56% ammonium, which is pretty significant. So in conclusion, um, phosphorus is the main uh, limiting factor for phytoplankton growth in the central basin. Um, we do see some secondary limitations of nitrogen, iron, and boron. Um, so the reason for the nitrogen limitation possibly could be the silica spermum out there. Um, the nitrogen limitation could be favoring that. Um, in all experiments that we per uh, performed, um, iron additions did not increase nitrate assimilation more than P only. So that was the graph with those red circles. So the addition of phosphorus and iron compared to just phosphorus alone didn't result in any extra nitrate assimilation um, from the algae. So the reason that this might be occurring is we think that the iron might be binding to dissolved organic carbon before the algae can use it. So when there's high dissolved organic carbon out in the lake, there's going to be low iron levels. Um, the nitrate is not going to be able to be assimilated because there's not going to be um, any iron out there for them to use. Um, there's going to be nitrogen, uh, limited nitrogen growth, and then that's what's causing these silica sperm blooms out there in the central basin. So um, eliminating the cyanobacteria is the goal. Um, the Western Basin has a 40% load reduction um, goal set in place, and um, the 40% load reduction will uh, reduce the biomass, but not necessarily um, limit the delicate sperm dominance due to the uh, their ability um, to fix nitrogen. So some acknowledgments. I'd like to thank Dr. Chapman for letting me work in his lab. Uh, research assistants Eric Parker and Kevin, um, Marissa Musk and Ohio Sea Grant for funding, and Friends of Stone Lab for funding. Um, we have not looked at that. Um, in the next three weeks, I'll try to see if I can look at that. Do you remember? So we we left, we looked at it on this at last year. Do you remember if there was any kind of research? I think I remember them seeing them in class. Few, but I think yeah, most of it wasn't seen there. So so yeah, something to keep in mind is there. They won't produce a heterocyst unless they're fixing the cold field, or they always are. Yeah, they need a cold They need both for fixation. So, yeah, they may want to produce them. They don't. Okay, so that was the question. So I know they need it for nitrogen fixation. I didn't know if they were there, whether they were nitrogen no, water, target the yeah. energy to put the nitrogen in the cold So I'll apologize in advance because this may be a question that, that, in the amount of time you've been working on this project, you may not be able to answer. But I, I love the hypothesis related to the iron. Can you imagine an experiment where you might test that hypothesis going forward? Um, possibly. I mean, the experiment that, that we did um, gave us pretty good results, but um, yeah, in the future, looking specifically at that and trying to formulate a more in detail experiment for that would be interesting. So, now that you're looking at the nitrogen fixation, what are how the algae grew, are you, how does that tie back to your initial surprise that Dalica sperm happens in the central basin? So we're surprised that it's happening in the central basin because 
the conditions that are out there are not exactly what is what it favors or what it likes to be in. Yeah. So um, the re the results that we got um, kind of give us insight in, as to why it's there. Um, so I'm sorry. What was the what was the question? Well, that that actually is exactly the question, right? So what are the conditions in the central basin that are actually now favoring its growth? Uh, the the low um, nitrogen levels. So the the low nitrogen levels allow um, the delicate sperm to thrive, but maybe not necessarily the other algae. There's not very many things that can grow under those conditions. So you wouldn't see like Interesting. Transported there from other places, but not started. But not started there. That's why the blooming is very seldom. All right, Taylor uh, comes to us from Kent State University, where I am also a faculty. Um, I actually forget when you applied here. Did you know I taught up here? A little bit. A little bit, yeah. I wasn't, wasn't sure if you were going up here. But yeah, it wasn't a concerted effort, but it was uh, great when I saw her application in our U school. Uh, so it made a lot of sense for us to work together. She's also doing an honors thesis back at Kent, and I don't know if this will go into that, but it's, some of her work is also slightly related, although there she's looking at um, invertebrates that disturb the sediment uh, and looking at nutrient cycling due to the invertebrates. Here she's going to just look at physical factors. All right, so I looked at the effects of sediment resuspension on nutrient flux and nitrification within Lake Erie. So here we see the sediment that's um, suspended in the lake. A lot of this here around Maumee is due to external inputs from the Maumee River. Um, but in shallow areas, you also see this resuspension from mixing and storms. So some problems we have in the western basin of Lake Erie, as we know, there's we get a lot of external inputs of nitrogen and phosphorus from agricultural runoff. And despite reductions in total phosphorus shown here um, since the 1970s, we still see these, this continued problem uh, of harmful algal blooms. Um, one of the characteristics of the Western Basin that kind of um, make this problem worse is that it's very shallow with uh, average depth of about 7.3 meters. So this makes this region very prone to mixing and turbulence near the sediment water interface. So this resuspension can influence nutrient availability within the surface water, and this release of nutrients into that surface water is known as internal loading. Um, here is a picture after a storm right outside the dining hall. So we see this resuspension from that wave action. Also, um, some estimates of this internal loading, um, the diffusive flux is estimated to be 3 to 7% of that International Joint Council um, external load goal of 111,000 metric tons. And um, that's just one side of internal loading. That's just the natural diffusion of nutrients from the sediment up into the surface water. But we also see this resuspension from storms as well. So for the uh, nutrients we see in the sediment, a lot of it comes from algal decomposition, um, where the algae gets buried and then decomposes. And we see ammonium, silicate, and phosphate in the sediment. So based on that diffusion, natural diffusion, we would expect to see ammonium, silicate, and phosphate also in the surface water. However, past results from last year's REU um, project, we don't really see a change in nitrate, um, I mean ammonium concentration compared to increasing suspended sediment. But we do see this increase in nitrate with increasing suspended sediment, whereas in the sediment, we don't typically see nitrate. It's very, very low to not available at all. So then, again, we see this um, availability of nitrate, so it must be coming from this ammonium somehow. So one mechanism of how this can occur is through the process of nitrification. So in this process, um, bacteria can convert ammonium into nitrate. 
and they use this ammonium as an energy source to fix their own carbon, and nitrate is produced as a waste product. And so some forms of, this is very important because some forms of nitrogen are thought to increase the size of tabs and their toxicity as well. So the overarching questions that we wanted to address were how does sediment resuspension um, caused by this wave and wind action from storms affect nutrient release in Lake Erie? And is nitrification occurring due to during the resuspension of the sediment and accounting for that nitrate that we see? So to investigate this, we sampled four sites within the western basin of Lake Erie. We sampled Mommy Bay, the Toledo water intake structure, um, Schoolhouse Bay, which is right off of Middle Bass Island, and within Sandusky Bay. Okay. Um, so to do this experimental study, we sampled sediment from each site uh, with the Ekman, using an Ekman dredge shown here. And then we collected about the top one centimeter of that sediment, um, which is the most um, likely to be resuspended. And we also collected uh, site water at about half a meter above the sediment surface, which again will um, be the water that's interacting with that sediment. So we pre-filtered our water and then uh, set up a gradient of sediment. Uh, we used an eyedropper to have a gradient, and we did zero to 10 drops of sediment. Um, we had two pairs, as shown here. One we added nitrification inhibitor to, which should stop that process of nitrification. And then the other one we did not add anything to. So after we added that sediment, we then covered the bottles in foil, um, put them in these bags here, submerged them, and tied them to the underneath the docks. And this was to um, try to inhibit any photosynthesis that might occur, which would then uptake, would um, use up the nutrients, and then affect our results that we're seeing. We left these sitting for about 48 hours under the docks, and this wave action was um, trying to mimic the natural uh, resource the mixing. So then we uh, gathered our samples and we filtered them out to analyze them for total suspended sediment to actually get a numerical value of that sediment in each sample. And then we put them in an oven and burned off all the organic matter to, um, to, much, to see that percent of that total suspended sediment that is actually organic matter. And then we looked at the water and we measured it for nutrient concentration, specifically nitrate and soluble reactive phosphorus, known as SRP, um, both which are utilized, as Maddie and Marissa had said, by algae. So first, looking at phosph the phosphorus flux, we see that with increasing suspended sediment, we have this increasing SRP, which then plateaus. Um, here, and this plateau is likely due to the sediment and water reaching an equilibrium of the phosphorus that that can be in, dissolved in the water. And we also see this at the other four, uh, three sites that we sampled. All of these relationships were um, statistically significant using a nonlinear regression. So then, moving on to nitrate. Um, we performed linear regressions with these, um, and we see an increase in nitrate uh, with that increase in total suspended sediment. For all of these, we saw strong relationships, and they're significant as well. So then moving back to the nitrification aspect of this experiment, um, remember we added nitrification inhibitor to one set of the samples. And again, that's converting ammonium into nitrate. So in a natural or uninhibited sample, we would ex from those past results, we expect to see that increase in nitrate with increasing sediment. Um, and in the inhibited sample, what that inhibitor should do is not allow for any nitrate to be produced. So then looking at this, these results, we see that this uninhibited sample, we again see that increase in nitrate. 
and in this inhibited sample, we don't see any buildup of nitrate. So this is suggesting that nitrification is occurring. And again, we see this at these other two sites, um, and we performed a statistical test called an ANCOPA, which um, compared these two slopes and told us that these slopes were indeed different than one, each other, than one another. So we wanted to look a little bit more into this idea of nitrification. So we add, so we did uh, ammonium additions. Um, so here on this, on the y-axis, we see a change in nitrate. So this is the uninhibited samples minus the inhibited samples. So we're just seeing that change overall. So we see here that we added about 10 micromoles of micromoles per liter of ammonium, and we see that same response in nitrate, and it's consistent throughout this data. So some major take-home points are that wind-driven sediment resuspension supplies the flux of nitrogen and phosphorus into the surface water, and that nitrification is transforming the nitrogen. So it's originating as ammonium in the sediment, but it's being converted to nitrate in the surface water. So this is very important um, because, as we see here, that phosphorus and nitrate does allow for more algal growth. So some major implications. Um, there may be lag time between actually reducing external inputs of nutrients and actually seeing a reduction of harmful algal blooms um, because of this internal source of nutrients. Also, changing frequencies of storms due to climate change um, can also alter this nutrient recycling from this internal loading. And this data potentially has the, um, could be potentially used to predict internal loading by using different um, ways of measuring that suspended sediment, like satellite imagery or buoys um, during these suspension events. And just want to say thank you to Dr. Jaren Beatty, the Women Magic class student who <laughs> helped me sample a lot. Captain Craig, even though he always yelled at me for getting mud on his deck. Um, the Water Quality Lab of Justin Chapman, Eric Parker, Kevin Jones, and Ohio Sea Grant and Stone Lab for giving me this opportunity. Um, so, so in the Western Basin, um, overall internal loading, it's like, a, it's a very small ask, uh, contributing factor to these algal blooms. Um, phosphorus is re resuspension due to diffusion is more prevalent in the Central Basin, whereas in the Western Basin, it is occurring through a different mechanism. I think it's I think it's kind of um, dependent on where you're looking to, like in the Mo in Mommy Bay, it might not be that much of a contributing factor. Whereas away from those river inputs, where they don't have those external inputs, this is very important to the algal growth that we see. Okay. So um, we never sampled too close to those storm events, um, but that would be, yeah, something to look into. Uh, a lot of times we weren't too close to those river inputs, so that should be minimal influence, but yeah. So there are more bacteria that like play a role in that conversion of nitrogen, so you were looking mm -hmm. at nitrification. What are the role you think those other groups of bacteria playing in this, and it may, was like, where your sediments come from, would it only lend itself to knowing organisms, the bacteria species that play a role in nitrification and, and eliminating the others? So what about the, the 
those other nitrogen? Yeah, so like denitrification yes. and those kind of things. Yes. Um, so all of, pretty much all, most of the Western Basin, especially the sites we sampled, are very shallow and are very oxygenated. So we're not really going to see very much denitrification because they need anaerobic conditions. Um, so the main driver would be that nitrification. Yeah. Camille Manukian as my REU student. She's a public health student from the Ohio State University. <laughs> um, she spent some time growing up in California and is from Massachusetts currently. And she'll be attending University of Massachusetts Bedford this fall. Um, and I picked her occupation out because she was very interested in working on plants. Um, she was the only one that put that down first. <laughs> so, Oh, I was very grateful that she was also a good sport because the first plant that she got to know very well was poison ivy. <laughs> so, I'm going to tell you a lot more about the forest composition over at Middle Bass Island. Um, but I also had a very good time working with her. Both of her parents are scientists, and I think she comes to this with a very analytical mind. So it's very good to work with her. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm lucky to have had you because I didn't know anything about plants or trees before I came here other than like intro bio stuff, so I've learned a lot. Um, so this summer we looked at the changes in forest composition in lowland island forests after the emerald ash borer. So a little background information first. The emerald ash borer is an invasive beetle um, that comes originally from Eastern Asia. It's currently found in 29 states and two provinces, and it feeds on the ash trees. So basically how that works is that the adult beetle will lay its eggs in the bark. And as the eggs hatch, the larvae will burrow into the um, tree and eat the phloem and the cambium of the tree or the insides and leave these really interesting trails behind. And that pretty much um, prevents the tree from transporting nutrients. And in a couple of years, the tree is dead. Uh, when the adults emerge from the tree, they leave behind these D-shaped exit holes, and that's pretty much the only way to tell that the tree is infested. So by the time um, you know that the tree is infested with the beetle, there's nothing really to do about it because it's already on its way to death, unfortunately. So all ash trees in the U.S. are susceptible to the emerald ash borer, but blue ash seems to be the most resistant, and there are studies looking at why that is and if that could be the one ash tree that would regenerate. So when a tree dies, it could either stay standing like this or fall over and cause a big mess that me and Lisa have to climb through to do our study. But either way, that will leave a canopy gap, which is a gap in the forest canopy left by a dead tree. Either when it's standing, as you see in this picture, all of these are dead ash trees, dead standing ash trees. Um, there won't be any leaves, obviously, to provide shade. Or if it's fallen, it'll cause a physical um, disturbance in the forest canopy. Um, so that allows for sunlight to come through the canopy and reach the forest floor, which causes an increased plant growth. And in those situations, there's usually an increase of invasive plant species because those are known to use the energy from the sun more efficiently, grow faster, and consequently outcompete the native plant species. So we conducted our study on Middle Bass Island, which is right across the water. Um, it's composed mainly of dolomite bedrock, which is similar to limestone, so it's pretty soft. The climate in the island area is a lot milder than on the mainland due to the stabilizing effect of the lake. So it's a really great place to see a lot of diversity in plants and animals. Um, the island in the past was used mainly for vineyards. So pretty much the whole island was deforested for these vineyards, but around Prohibition time, they were all abandoned, um, mostly, and uh, left to regrow naturally. So a lot of it now is re regrown back to its natural forest. Um, it is mostly residential with some protected forests and wetlands. 
So the ash tree on Middleback Island is mostly green ash, which is known to be the most adaptable type of ash tree in the country um, because it likes all different kinds of soil types and soil moistures. So Middleback's um, low-lying forests are really a great environment for the green ash, except for when the emerald ash borer comes along. It's very susceptible to that, obviously. So um, when that happened, pretty much all the ash trees on Middle Bass Island were killed. And in our small study area alone, we saw over 60 dead ash trees. So these are uh, the pieces of land that we studied, the Schneider Tract and the Diapering Tract. And those will both be owned by the Putin Bay Township Park District very soon. As you can see, this is a historical map. So uh, we believe that they were used as vineyards, like I said, abandoned around Prohibition time. And they're now very dense forests. So we went into our study with three main questions. First, has the forest composition of the island lowland forest changed due to the emerald ash borer? And if so, what trees are replacing the green ash in an island lowland forest? And have we seen an increase in invasive plant species? And this is just an aerial view of um, our, the current view of our pieces of land. So we use similar methods to Borner, uh, who is the man who pretty much pioneered this study in the 80s, and he actually studied um, the Lake Erie Islands as well. So we set up Quadras, and we actually had a map made, um, so it's a little easier to understand what we did. So in each of the two pieces of land, we made 50-meter transect lines, and then alternating on that line, we made five 10 by 10 meter squares to study in. And within those, we made nested quadrats. So there was a 5 by 5 meter quadrat and a uh, 2 by 0.5 meter quadrat. And so in total, we had 10 um, study areas. And we marked them all with tape, as you can see here. <laughs> and we had to get creative sometimes because, like I said, there was a lot of debris in the forest, which made it really interesting. So within those plots, we wanted to measure the density, species, size, and diameter at breast height of all of the trees that fit within the five categories we were looking at. So quickly, diameter at breast height is just like a standardized measurement where you measure the diameter of the tree um, at about four and a half feet up the trunk. So in each of the 10 by 10 meter plots, the whole plot, we measured all trees with a DBH of greater than 2.5 centimeters. So we counted, we found the species of them by looking at like, the, plant, the leaves and the branches and the bark, and then we marked them so we wouldn't recount any trees um, because, as you can see, there's a lot of trees. Uh, in the 5 by 5 meter plot, we measured smaller trees that had a DBH of greater than 1 centimeter but less than 2.5 centimeters. And then finally, in the small spot, we measured seedlings that were less than one centimeter at diameter at breast height. And those ones, we just counted to see how many there were. We didn't necessarily measure their diameter because they're very small. So from that data, we calculated relative density, relative frequency, relative coverage, and the importance value. And so relative density is pretty much how, much, how many of that one species there are compared to all the other species. Relative frequency is how many of that species we find in that certain um, plot of land. And then um, relative coverage is a number we get from a conversion of pretty much the area that the canopy of the tree covers if you go down to the um, ground from the canopy. So when we counted all the trees, we got all this data and we, in total, counted 454 trees, um, most of which were roughly dogwood, which is good because that's a native plant species, so that's still doing well. Um, a couple things to notice are the buckthorn, which is a new invasive plant species on Middle Bass Island. It actually has not really been seen before our study, so that's a little concerning. Um, we saw 13 of those in our area. Um, another thing, silver maple, we only saw 16 of those where we were measuring, but they were really big, so you'll see later that they were still really important in the data. Um, Amer honeysuckle is another more well-known um, invasive plant species, and another thing to mention, mulberry. Um, the ones on Middle Bass Island are actually hybrids 
of an invasive um, mulberry species and a native mulberry species, so we consider them to be invasive as well. Also green ash, we only counted 10, and they were all pretty small. <coughs> So from those numbers, as I said, we calculated um, relative density, relative frequency, and relative coverage. And I explained what those were earlier. Um, we don't really need to get into like the depth of the calculations, but those are really important to find the importance value, which is the goal of our um, study, is to find the Borner importance value. And so, as I mentioned earlier, Borner kind of pioneered this study, so he um, made this calculation for these values to show the overall importance of a tree in the forest. So taking into consideration how many trees there are, how often we see them, and how big they are, the coverage, we can find the importance value. And it just ranges from one to five, and if it's less than one, it wasn't present in the plot. So here are the importance values that we got. And as I said earlier, we want to compare um, our results to earlier results to see how the forest composition has changed over time and um, before and after the emerald ash borer. So on um, the first two columns, you'll see the Borner studies. He actually um, studied the forest composition on Middle Bass Island in 1984, which was before the emerald ash borer was in the United States. So um, these were before any ash trees were really um, killed. Eckert is... Um, from 2007, uh, Dr. Payne actually did a similar REU project, and they were looking at kind of the mortality of the uh, emerald, uh, the ash tree, and um, right in the height of the, when the emerald ash borer was on the island. And our results were from pretty much after the emerald ash borer had killed all the trees. So you can see there was an increase in a lot of the species because as the um, emerald ash, as the ash trees are dying, um, a lot of there's a lot of change in the forest composition. The only decrease is in the ash tree, which you see um, it was very important, very prevalent um, in the island forests before, and now it wasn't present in one of our sites and had a low importance value in the other. And again, you'll see that um, buckthorn was not present before, Amer honeysuckle was not present before, and those are both pre prevalent now in the forest, and they're the invasive species, the main invasive species. So in conclusion, we did see a change in the forest composition after the disappearance of the ash trees. And we saw that in the major decrease in green ash. Um, we saw an increase in invasive species, including the appearance of the new species buckthorn, um, but we did still see native species persisting despite the disturbances caused by fallen ash trees or the presence of invasive plant species. So we found um, trees that had been knocked down by dead ash trees or split in half and they were still alive and growing and kind of twisting and turning to find the sun, and that was really cool to see. So the native species are still doing pretty well. Another thing I want to point out is the epicormic branching and the young ash trees. Epicormic branching is when a, a dead ash tree will actually grow new branches at the base of the trunk. So we did count those. And then the young ash trees we found because actually the emerald ash borer only eats the ash tree at a certain maturity and size. So the ones we found were probably too small to have been invaded by the beetle. So we don't know if they're going to survive because we didn't really see any beetles or <laughs> we don't know if they're still in the forest, but that would be interesting to follow up on. So implications, um, this demonstrates that the removal of a single species has an effect on the whole forest. We saw the death of one species, the green ash, and it changed the entire forest composition. Um, this gives us a better understanding of the ecology of the land being purchased and used by the Putten Bay Township Park District. It can give them ideas on how to preserve the natural landscape of the island because that's a main goal of um, the park district and kind of the state of Ohio now is preserving these islands to their natural habitat. Um, and finally, a better understanding of the effect of invasive animal and plant species on island forest composition, hopefully how to prevent something like this from happening again. And um, this wouldn't have been possible without all the help I got. Um, I'd like to especially thank the Friends of Stone Lab and Ohio Sea Grant and Lisa Broll for teaching me everything I know about trees. <laughs> so thank you.
time for one or two quick questions. Yeah, Julie? Uh, do you know if these uh, new complaints you're finding, like the hypothetical and the soft score, uh, can still be there when new community tabs are closed, closed, or are they uh, pretty much forgotten about? Well, yeah, they are kind of early successional, so they do like uh, high levels of sunlight, but we saw them kind of everywhere in the forest. Um, and they were getting pretty big, so they they seemed to be out competing, and still they were still getting that sunlight, um, even though those canopy gaps are closing because they were closing those canopy gaps. I would say, um, yeah. It looks like they're there to stay. Although um, the park district is getting a lot of funding for the next few years to actually remove some of those, so that'll be good. So. Is there any place for the beetle to stay? You know, so if we killed all the adult ash trees, but you're seeing this epicormic growth and you're seeing some ash, do they have a chance? I mean, is it one of these things where now that it's come through the first pulse and we've lost the mm -hmm. major composition in 15 or 20 years when these are adult again, is there a chance that they can stay or? Well, their life cycle is around one to two years. And so they usually kind of stay as in the eggs or as larva throughout the winter and then will emerge like more in the spring and summer. So I don't know if they would survive 15 to 20 years. Um, so yeah, I, I, I don't know. But that, that's something that we are interested in and in seeing if those um, young ash trees will actually survive. Because there, it's hard to tell what, where the beetles are. But so they yeah, are I don't special, know. I don't think they would. Okay, so they are a specialist um, on ash trees. They won't use any yeah. other. Is there right. anything else they would eat? No, not not as we've seen, no. Good. Okay, thank you. All right, so last, <laughs> not least, Stacy Clay comes to us from Ohio the State University, uh, where she's in fish and birds and lesser wildlife. Prediction 
Um, in either case, the prediction is that if preserves are better breeding habitat, then we'll see higher survivorship for red-winged blackbirds in American robin in the um, preserves over the human-dominated areas. So this is one of the species that is, we used for our study, the red-winged blackbirds. Um, you'll see that the males are glossy black, and they have a red and yellow patch on their shoulders. Um, females are streaky brown, and the adult females will also get a more mellow um, red patch on their shoulders. They eat mostly insects and seeds, and they, um, in breeding season, they're mostly found in wet, um, wet places like fresh water, like fresh or salt, salt water marshes. Um, the breeding season starts in early spring and continues through most of the summer. Males like to sit high on their perches and defend their territory, which a lot of the people in Potent Bay have experienced. They will peck the back of your head. <laughs> um, females stay lower, um, searching through vegetation and uh, for insects and gathering nectar materials. So then this is the other species used in our study, the American robin. American robins are gray-brown in color, and they have um, warm orange belly. The males will have a darker head, and the females will have um, paler heads. That's how you can, one way you can determine the sex. Um, they're common across the entire continent, and they thrive in various habitats. Um, they're very much a generalist species. Um, they primarily feed on earthworms, insects, and different fruits and berries. Um, and robin breeding season is usually last from April to July. And so then our methods. So for for four weeks we did our field work, and um, we set when we would do our field work we would go out and we set up nest nets um, in the banding location for that day to catch the birds. So this here is an example of the, what a mist net is. So you have the two weed bars that go to the ground, then the poles, and then the birds get caught in here. And so all birds that we caught get banded. So we caught, catch a lot of other birds that aren't robin and red-winged blackbirds. All of those also get banded. Um, and we identified the age and sex of each bird. And so what we're really looking for is we're looking for recaptures. So birds that have been banded in, previously, in previous years and we want to catch those birds because we can't identify those. We can't get a survivorship estimate if we don't have uh, the birds to see if they've survived or not. And so banding locations, we had five different banding locations. So for the um, human-dominated areas, we had one um, on Gibraltar, um, North Bass Island, and Bayview, which is right here. And then for the preserves, we had Middle Bass Island, there's a preserve there where we banded, and South Best Island, this is here we banded, this, that's where we banded. Um, so we banded four times a week, um, and each time we go out, we go to a different banding site, so we alternate um, which banding site we're going to. And so then the program that we use to analyze all this data is MARC. Um, and MARC estimates, estimates the survivorship for us. Um, but to know the survivorship, like I said before, um, you have to be able to recapture the banded bird. And so when a bird that is banded um, isn't recaptured, it could be for um, two possible reasons. One is that it's dead, or two, it was there, we just didn't catch it. So Mark takes this into account. It takes into account those birds that were around, and we just didn't catch them. And so it does this, but in later years, when you do catch these birds, that's when Mark knows they were alive, and then it will correct for that. So um, um, four sets of models for estimating the C is the survivorship and P is probability of recapture. So we had um, four, four sets of models for this. So one, either survivorship and probability of recapture are constant everywhere at all times. So the dots here mean that they're constant. Um, two, survivorship and probability of recapture vary by year. So T is for time. Um, three, survivorship probability of recapture vary by location, so by island, by habitat, so I is for island. And four, it could be a combination um, of the first three. So for example, you could have um, uh, survivorship varying by island and um, probability of recapture varying by year. So um, model selection, which model gives us the best estimates 
of survivorship in P and um, probability of recapture. So to figure out which model gives us the best estimates, we use what's called AIC, so IK key information criterion. Um, it tells you which model gives you the best explanation for variation using the least amount of perimeters. So it best estimates, so it gives you a model that best estimates survivorship and um, probability of recapture. So with AIC, the lowest score wins. So you see here that these two have the lowest score. And scores within two are considered equally likely models. So we actually ran both of these models because they're considered equally likely. And then you have the AIC weight, which takes all models into account, but some models, best models, have more influence than others. So this right here is the AIC weight. So when you're using model averaging, you use the AIC weight. It just means that these ones will have more influence than these ones down here. And so then now, um, these are some of the birds that we've caught. So this is the northern ruffling swallow. We caught that here on Gibraltar. I think we caught about four of those. Um, this is the Baltimore Oriole. Um, we, caught the, we caught those in Middle Bass. We caught some here in Gibraltar, um, also some in South Bass. Um, this is the yellow shafted flicker. It was a really cool bird to catch. We caught that out on Middle Bass. Um, and this is the Orchard Oriole. Um, this one we caught on South Bass, I believe. So pretty cool bird to see. Um, and then, so this study has been going on for seven years now. So there's seven years of banding data. So I'll show you what that looks like. So, so far, this study has caught 2,334 birds total, um, 37 different species. Um, red-winged blackbird, there's been 867 captures of red-winged blackbird. Um, 37 of those have been recaptured. And 231 um, American robin, and 13 of those have been recaptured. So just for this year, we caught 300, we caught and banded 324 birds. So um, survivorship probability of recapture for the American robin. So these were our best two models that I showed you in the last in the slide earlier. So what does this show us? So this shows us that the survivorship for each island um, from, varies from island to island, but it's constant each year. And we are equally likely to recapture birds, that's what this dot here means, um, on any island no matter which year. And then for our second model, he, our second model here shows us that survivorship is constant for all islands and for each year, and our probability for recapturing them varies for each island, but it's constant each year. So then after running these models, this is what we got. So survivorship was at about 50% for Gibraltar um, and Bay View as well across all years. But you'll see that South Bass, North Bass, and Middle Bass have very low survivorship here. <laughs> okay. 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 Um, so you see that South Bass, North Bass, and Middle Bass have a very low survivorship here. But if you look at the probability of recapture here, you'll see that we have a very low probability of recapture here. So birds that, so American robin that we're banding in these locations, we hardly ever recapture them. And so that's why you're getting such a low um, survivorship. So, but the um, overall survivorship is about 50%. Um, and recapture, the probability of recapture is about 13%. Yep, okay. Um, okay, and so then survivorship and probability of recapture for the red-winged blackbird. So our best model for the red-winged blackbird was survivorship is constant for all islands um, during all years, and probability of recapture um, varies for time. So this is what we got after running that model. Um, survivorship for Red Wing Blackbird um, across all time was about, um, I mean, across all islands was about 46%. So for each island, um, it, it didn't matter which island to see, uh, average survivorship was about 50, was about 40, 
6%. However, the probability of recapture, um, the probability of recapture was very low for each island. So in the previous slide, the, our probability of recapture was about 13%, which is actually pretty good for us. And here we're at like 0 0.8, I mean 0 0.08, 0 0.06, so not, not too great. So comparing habitats, human dominated versus preserved. So firstly, we were comparing um, survivorship and probability of recapture between um, each island individually. Now we are pulling those islands together and we're just comparing based on different habitats. So on human dominated versus the preserved. So it's the same process using the IC to find the best model and then using those models. Um, let's see what you got. So, um, so yeah, so we did that with both the American Robin and Red Wing Blackbird. So this is what we saw um, after comparing habitats. So after running the model, um, survivorship of both Red Wing Blackbirds um, and Red of both Red Wing Blackbirds and American Robin were higher in human dominated areas than in the preserves. The Red Wing Blackbird 57% survivorship in human dominated areas and 26% survivorship in preserved. And for the American Robin, we also saw 57% survivorship in human dominated areas and 37% um, survivorship in preserved. However, we have a very large standard error here, which makes this um, not statistically significant. So to discuss all this, so again, we had two separate stories. We had the islands and the habitats that were um, that we're comparing here. So first we tested the um, dif difference of survivorship and um, the survivorship and probability of recapture between each island. And then um, we compared the uh, survivorship and probability of recapture for each of the habitats. So first for the comparison survivorship across years for each island, we saw that we have a low recapture rate, but enough data that Mark can account for that now. Um, we found that survivorship was about 50% 50, 50 across all islands for both red winged blackbirds and American robins. Therefore, in this comparison, the human dominated area is equally good habitat as a preserve. So it's not saying the preserves are better, it's not saying the preserves are worse. They're there, they're there and they're doing their job. Um, and then for the second comparison of survivorship across years for each habitat, we found that the human dominated areas, areas have a higher survivorship for both red winged blackbirds and American robins. However, um, the standard error makes this not statistically, statistically significant. Um, so the study has been going on long enough now that we are finally getting good estimates of survivorship. I know in the early years it just weren't good estimates at all, but now we do have enough recaptures that Mark's starting to account for that and we're getting some good estimates. So more data, um, more time could allow for one story to prevail so you would see Either is it um, both are just equally likely, the survivorship is the same, or is it that the human dominated areas are better? So we'll be able to see that. But one thing to remember is that the red winged blackbirds and American robins are being used as proxies here. So both of those species are very much generalists and they do good in a lot of areas. They do good around humans. So you have to take that into account too. So you have to ask, is that the same for other birds too? Is that true for other species? So what this all is really saying is that it's time to look at reproductive data. So if next year a study could happen where um, someone could come at the start of the breeding season and do the nesting success um, experiment. That's really how you could clear up a lot of this. So these are some of my references. And I just want to thank um, Dr. Marshall for allowing me to assist him in his research and Stone Laboratory and Ohio Sea Grant for allowing me this amazing opportunity. Sure. I know that um, I know that we've caught a lot of more red-winged blackbirds and robins, um, but I, 
compared to, we weren't really looking at the other birds. I didn't really look at the other birds when I was doing the data, so I'm not sure about that. Um, maybe looking at a species that's not so much a generalist, so that is more affected by uh, different habitats um, more strongly, but I, a specific one, I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a good number. So a lot of the literature, that's what it's saying, is that everywhere it's, it's about 50% is the survivorship. So that's good this year that we got that, at least it's closer to what the literature is saying. So. All right, thank you. Ohio, yeah, Ohio chapter of the American Fishery Society. Yeah. So yeah. There are, that's another good place for undergraduates. So be looking for places, talk to your advisor about good places to, to get your feet wet with the conference presentation. It's a very good credential to have on your CV within the grad school or internships or whatever. It's a good place to make those connections. So, Justin, can I, put, can I ask you to have all the supervisors toss those different options that are coming up over the next year? And, yet, and can you send them out as emails to all those yeah. REQs? That'd be great. Mm -hmm. um, and and the, to that, Ohio Sea Grant Stone Lab will pay for your attendance at that conference. So let us know. We'll cover your room, your meals, the registration. Now, we've had people that have gone to Florida, Florida before. That's a heavier bill to cover. So try and keep it regional. Um, but again, I don't want to deter you from presenting anywhere. But if you can keep it regional, that'd be great. But, but Ohio Sea Grant Stone Lab will cover the cost for you to do all of that presentation work. Also, if you can push some of these publications, I think some of these are pretty close. If you add another year of data in there, let us know because we'll cover the charges that are associated with publication too. So keep up the great work. This is phenomenal. Um, the one thing I wanted to plug, and I don't want to take too much time, um, but uh, there is a Buckeye Friends <coughs> Laboratory student group. 
So if you've enjoyed your time on the island and you want to reconnect with the people that are sitting in the room around you or people that have been up here in previous years and that will be coming here in future years, um, it's at OSU, but you can be at another university and be a member of the student club. Um, so I encourage you to go, and I'll have uh, Justin send the link to you guys, too. It's Buckeye Friends of Stone Lab. They have a lot of outreach events they go to, a lot of stream cleanups they go to. And then once a year, usually in the fall, they come up and help us break down the island, get it ready for the winter. But also there's kind of a reunion and a kind of just catching up with people. So I encourage you to look into Buckeye Possible. Actually, I think we're losing our president and vice president this year. So if you're looking for an office that's in a student award, think about that. Okay? I also want to say thanks for first round of applause to the supervisors and the students again. The other two groups that we need to thank, too, is I know that there's a lot of staff that help out with this, but I know there are students on the island that aren't RU students that get interest in what's going on and have stepped up to help. So a round of applause to those of you who aren't RU students that help out. <laughs> so you guys are done. I'd love to talk to the RU students and supervisors for just a second, but the rest of you are free to go. So the uh, RU students and the supervisors can come up here. That'd be great. So make sure you stop it. Yeah. Bring them, as you usually do. Yeah. 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 Yeah.